John 17, verse 21. <clears throat> back to verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for his disciples, but for all of us now in verse, uh, in that verse. And then we um, uh, get to verse 21, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. In them and you, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Probably for the last hundred years or so, there's been within evangelicalism, this idea that when Jesus is praying here in John 17, he's praying for something that we still are waiting to have that answer for. Have you ever heard that before? Right? Like, you know, uh, we need to get together and do all these things and ignore our doctrinal differences and ignore our methodological differences, get all together, and then... The Lord's prayer will be, you know, his prayer right here will be answered, and we can all join hands and sing Kumbaya, right? And that's been said since the World Council of Churches in the 1920s. I grew up, I'm 51 years old, I've grown up listening to this. You go to a Christian music festival, and some big name preacher wants to get together with a Roman Catholic, you know, priest or whatever and do communion at the, at the Christian concert. And this verse is inevitably cited as the reason why we should ignore what we each say about communion and what we believe about everything else about the gospel. We're just going to put that aside for a minute so we can fulfill this thing. And I mean no disrespect to the word of God, uh, but if you look at what the text is saying, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that <laughs> they are going to be one just as the Father and Jesus are one. Was there ever a time when they weren't? And this is a, it's like Sunday school, right? There's never a time. <laughs> no. So there's never a time when they weren't. There's never a time where they won't be. And this is reality. Now, if you look at the history of the interpretation of this text, and then look just about everybody, even some liberal scholars that would really be part of the World Council of Churches' activities, even they say that this is talking about a spiritual unity that exists between all true believers. This is real. Now, we are one. Amen? <laughs> we are one in Christ, and we are one in the Word of God. That exists now. Present tense, it exists now. So when you have an organization or you have a group of people that come along and they say, we want John 17 type unity. That's what we want. We, want John, we just got to get everybody together and have this John 17 type unity. Let me tell you, they're selling you something. <clears throat> Let me give you some quotes so you know I'm not just making this stuff up. Marcus Rainsford, Our Lord Prays for His Own. It's a wonderful book, one of the best books on John 17. He says, we need to be reminded that the Lord's prayer is not the origin of the union of which he speaks, or the cause of it, but the fruit and result of it. He's praying because of the unity, is what he's saying. He is not praying that a union might be established between himself and his people, which hitherto had not existed, but that the union should be enjoyed and manifested by his believing people. 
And then so you go further, uh, Meryl C. Tenney wrote a book called John, the Gospel of Belief. It's a commentary on the Gospel of John. And commenting on this, he says, Within the church of historic Christianity, there have been wide divergences of opinion and ritual. Unity, however, prevails wherever there is a deep and genuine experience of Christ. For the fellowship of the new birth transcends all historical and denominational boundaries. Paul of Tarsus, Luther of Germany, Wesley of England, Moody of America would find deep unity with each other, though they were widely separated by time, by space, by nationality, by educational background, and by ecclesiastical connections. Such unity was what Jesus petitioned in his prayer, for he defines it as a unity which he obtained between himself and the Father, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us. This relationship lay in a common uh, nature rather than an identity of minds or of persons. Jesus did not pray for absolute unanimity of mind, nor for the uniformity of practice, nor for union of visible organization, but for the underlying unity of spiritual nature and of devotion which would enable his people to bear a convincing testimony before the world. He wasn't praying that we'd all be under one organization. He was praying that we would be all united in the truth. And if you are not united in the truth, you're not united at all. John Flavel, <clears throat> Puritan, warns about people who are trying to get unity through unbiblical methodologies. He says, unity amongst those that hold not the head is rather a conspiracy than a gospel unity. Believers and unbelievers may have a political or civil union, but there is no spiritual unity but what flows from joint membership in Christ. What am I saying? What I'm saying is we have this unity, and we, we cannot, we got to watch out for organizational unity, and we cannot unify where there are unbiblical methodologies. We'd be very clear about that. What you read in the Norman Statement, or if you haven't, if you weren't here this morning, make sure you check out the Norman Statement. But what you're seeing there in the Norman Statement is, or methodology, we're striving to have a biblical methodology. Where that does not exist, we cannot have unity. Another place where we cannot have unity is where you might have a violation of conscience. A violation of conscience. You might say, well, I don't know how strong I am in this particular area to give like a biblical reason for this. But yet, if I go along with this, it's going to violate my conscience. Now, that's an important thing. Your conscience should be informed by the word of God. And if you're having this violation of conscience, you should probably go back and look at the word of God again and just make sure that you're not being a tyrant over the other person. But by the same token, if you study the word of God, and there's still this difference of opinion, but you know you can't do it because of your own conscience, don't do it. Don't do it. For me, and I have, like, <laughs> it's easy for me. It's easy for me personally not to be part of a lot of things. I'm kind of like a free agent in the NFL or something, right? I'd like to be a free agent in the NFL. Um, where I, I'm not really committed to any one particular organization. You know, I'm not, people all think I'm like end abortion now because we did babies are murdered here and, you know, Jeff Durbin and I must have each other on speed dial or something. Um, that's not true. Same thing, uh, Free the States, I'd say I'm actually getting closer to them all the time for various reasons. Um, but I have a certain amount of freedom. I kind of learned this from watching Kali operate. Um, 
I love the way Kali operates, and um, I've been learning from him. You know, OSA, whatever, I'm not really part of any of that. So this is easy for me to say. Nobody's writing me checks. <clears throat> <laughs> but on the other hand, it's not. Because I have friends in all of those places. And I just don't want to throw those friendships away either. So I have to be careful about how I talk about it. But when it comes to the gospel, we dare not compromise it in order to accomplish a goal. I'll just say that, say it that way. And if I were to join in some efforts that are out there right now, they're being, at least lately, being portrayed as abolitionists to some degree, I would literally have to go out in front of a clinic with people that really don't believe the same gospel I believe. I'm not talking about the Catholics. I'm talking about people that are like oneness Pentecostals or modalists that don't believe in the Trinity. I'd have to join with people that think they're apostles and stuff. I'd have to join with people that are just, they're, they're preaching an easy believism gospel. Just pray this prayer and you're saved. I'd have to join with a lot of different so-called Protestant evangelical gospels that not only violate my conscience, they violate the word of God. Both. So I'm just going to, I'm really just trying to share my heart on this. I am not doing it. And the reason I'm not doing it isn't because I'm just some kind of genius or something. I'm doing it because I love the Lord. And if we love him, we will not line up with what he hates. So I'm just going to put it this way and get in trouble and that'll be fine. Um... When we're tempted to try to gain cred, street credit, or cred, whatever, with Republican politicians, we do not need to say that we're pro-life. Right. We're not. <laughs> I mean, just read the, the statement. We're not. We shouldn't be. And the way I'm going to say this is last year we had David Lowe running against Stephanie Click in Texas. Stephanie Click was the champion of the heartbeat bill in the state of Texas. She had every pro-life endorsement you can have, and maybe some that don't even exist. <laughs> I'm not sure. Texas Right to Life, Texas Alliance for Life, Susan B. Anthony Fund, on and on and on. He, uh, she had, Stephanie Click had, every endorsement that you could have. We had a great abolitionist candidate, David Lowe. And David didn't have any of those. So pray tell, what am I supposed to do at the polling place? <laughs> Stand up there and say, well, he's more pro-life than you are? He's more pro-life than Stephanie Click? Who's going to believe that? She has every pro-life endorsement. So how do you distinguish? Well, I don't know. Call yourself an abolitionist. <laughs> which is what he did, Right? And then he goes out there in the culture. How do they respond to that? How could they shoot that down? Only one way. They had to lie about him. First way they lied about him, he's really pro-choice. What in the world? How do you get there? Well, you take a quote out of context from the Liberator podcast, turn it into a TV commercial, and run it across the Metroplex. And they spent millions of dollars on that. He got half a million dollars from Dade Phelan, Speaker of the House in Texas. Half a million dollars in in-kind donations, basically airtime, radio time, TV time. That's how they did it. He was outspent $5 million to $500,000. He was leading going into the early voting until they figured out he was leading. And then they poured all this money into her campaign 
Next thing you know, five, they have $5 million. He raised half a million, and he lost by about 800 votes. That's how committed they are to making sure she has that $7,000 a year salary. You can't make this stuff up. You want to call yourself pro-life? You want to do that to get cred credentials? I don't want those credentials. You shouldn't want them either. So I'm just going to say it. Guys, <laughs> I can't think of a better organization than getting churches out on the streets and on abortion now. I love Jeff Durbin. I love those guys. But as long as... We continue to try to sound like we're more pro-life than the other people. We're wrong. We're not more pro-life than they are. You can't get more compromise than that. So don't do it. We don't have to. We've got the word of God. We've got the word of God. Just, yeah. OSA, the same thing. Jason Storms, brother, I love you. I get what you're saying, that there are people in the pro-life world that have been around a long time and we should speak respectfully. I get that too. But what I'm saying is we don't need that moniker. We don't need that label. There's too much sin and corruption tied to that label. I don't want it. And I, I hope I still have friendships. Maybe not. I don't, but I think I will. I really do. I think I will. But I, uh, we got to talk about it out in the open rather than in quiet meetings behind the scenes. So I'm kind of nervous right now, and I'm sure my voice, I'm trembling and all this. And sometimes when I preach, I feel like I'm going to my death. Um, <clears throat> But this is one of those times, and I think what our attitude needs to be, regardless of what happens in the pro-life world and how much they try to steal our language and the rest of it, we can't be part of that. We can't let them do that. So the only way not to let them do that is by taking firm, hard stands on these things and not moving, right? And so I think we just lead. I think we lead. And we let them catch up. Don't worry about it. Keep preaching the word. Keep being faithful to the word. Don't move. And then if they start adopting our language, well, they're going to do that. They're going to lie. But maybe by God's grace, God will save somebody. And they'll really get it. And every now and then, you see somebody coming out of it. Every now and then, you see somebody coming out of it. What time is it? Game time. <laughs> All right, so what do we have? If we get into this spot, right? Say I'm sitting down with my brothers, and I'm trying to reason with them. I wouldn't do it quite the same way I'm doing it right now. But there is a way to do it. And the way to do it, I want to share this with you, because I think sometimes, we, well, a lot of times, we get this wrong. This is where we get it wrong. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Go there for a second. If I haven't ticked you off yet, it's just because I'm not trying yet. I'm getting there. Hang on. I'm going to tick you off eventually. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 24. And I say all this, and right now some people are going to say, well, you're contradicting yourself. Preaching is different than how I talk to people individually. When I talk to them, I try to aim for this lately. <laughs> when Russell and I, we were not, I was not aiming for this at all. <laughs> I was like looking at Russell through a bullseye thing. Um, and that was wicked, by the way. Well, let me say this about that since it was brought up. There are those that were influenced by things that I said back in the day, and that's why they, were, they took so long. I'm not taking credit. 
like <laughs> for this. I, it's messed up. But there are some that listen to what I said in a short video that I made about AHA, and they use that as their justification to stand against AHA. And I was wrong, and I repented of that. Others followed suit. Those of you who did follow suit and have said things about Russell and have said things about AHA, I'm calling on you to repent. And I'm calling on you to do it that way. I'm asking you, please, for the sake of the body of Christ, just admit that you are wrong. Because that's the only way you really get past that. There's reconciliation can't happen that any other way. And so let's do that. Yes, you have to swallow your pride. Yes, you have to admit that you were wrong. But man, the joy that I have in Christ is so worth it. And the burden, the monkey that's off of my back, and the freedom that I can have to be with brothers and sisters in this room that we never had before, that's worth it. We're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation, but how can we be if we're not reconciled? It's a false unity. So if I'm sitting down with people that I disagree with, how, do I, how should I respond? Look at verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. The methodology is right there for you in 24 and 25. I'm going to do this quick. We have a negative command and four positive statements. The first negative command is in the first part of verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. The word servant is the word dulon, and it means that we're slaves. So the man of God is meant is a slave, and as R.C.H. Lenski said, a slave has no will of his own. When he works, he is governed by the will of the Lord. When it's speaking of contention, here, must not be quarrelsome. It could be translated a man of strife or known as someone who's contentious. We don't want to be known as that. We want instead as slaves of Christ to be known as people who are not quarrelsome. We have that reputation. So let's own it. And then let's repent of it. Let's not be quarrelsome, but instead do these other things that I'm about to look at in just a second. James chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. In verse 4 of James chapter 4, it's talking about worldliness. Often, we think of worldliness as watching the wrong movies or listening to the wrong music, when really, it's just that we like to fight. <clears throat> In this context, anyway. So we do not fight in a contentious way, but positively, what do we do? Well, in the next part of verse 24, kind to everyone. Everyone? Everyone. Kind to everyone. According to Ellicott, the commentator, this has to do with our outward demeanor toward everybody. Early on when I was being courted as an NAMB church planner, <clears throat> I had to go to New York City for like an eight-hour interview. And uh, at the end of it, <clears throat> one of the pastors said, John, we don't think you are aware of how you come across to other people. And they were right. I wasn't. It's a common trait of people in leadership that we oftentimes don't think about how we come across because we don't care. We've got the truth. But we have a command here in Scripture that our demeanor is to be open and receiving and kind. So where we failed in this, we must repent. And we must learn to be kind to everyone. Even while we're saying hard things, I'm not saying don't say the hard things. I'm saying say them in such a way that the people will still want to talk to you later. If they want to come, if they want to repent and get right 
and, and talk to you and find out how, you they got to be approachable so they will come back and talk to you. You heard Blake say it didn't take a sledgehammer for him. It took a touch. So he's kind to everyone. He's quick to teach instead of fight. Are you quick to fight? Or, the next part of the verse, able to teach. And the idea and the context has to do with being ready to teach. It's uh, the same as the elder qualification, same word as 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, but you have to, in the context, it means that you're quick to teach and show people from the scriptures, this is why. And you don't move from that. The third positive thing, patiently enduring evil. In other words, he is patient when he's attacked in an evil way. So we have to be patient when evil is happening against us. And evil happens against us. Right? Your, your motivations are called into question. Why are you doing this? You must be crazy. And sometimes you're spit upon, had a gun pull on you or something in an abortion clinic, and all these things, they accuse you of evil things. I'm sure the media here in Wichita is doing that. How do you endure that? Patiently is what the scripture says. This term is only, this is the only time it's used in the New Testament. It's comprised of two Greek words that literally mean endure evil. And so that's what we have to do. Jesus endured evil. He went to a cross. He was the only one who was ever really truly falsely accused. He never sinned, ever. And he bore the wrath of what we deserved, and he patiently endured. He didn't even open his mouth, the scripture says. Think about that. We have to learn that. And then the last positive, or in the first part of verse 25, the last positive statement here. He educates firmly yet gently. I'm translating that. Correcting his, op his opponents with gentleness. The word correcting is a, from a Greek term that has to do with a father instructing his child. So when we have opponents, we have to learn to correct them and educate them like I would do with my children when I'm teaching them something. How many here right now are just like feeling, I'm a failure? Raise your hand. Confession is good for the soul. It's okay. The rest of you are lying. All right. <laughs> do the Ray Comfort thing on you. <clears throat> you should feel that conviction. We should all feel that conviction. So what do we do with it? Well, the only thing I know to do with it is to repent. Yeah. Just to repent. We need to make those hard stands. I'm not, I've made my own. I'm in, I'm in trouble, remember? Probably. From the first half of this thing. However... We have to demonstrate this, 2 Timothy 2, as well. We can expose what a false unity is. But if we want true unity under the truth, the only way to have that is to do this, 2 Timothy 2. That's the only way. It's too much. How do I do that? I don't know how, you know, if you've been in a pattern of not doing this, it seems like it's too much. Well, it's not. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God and the power of the Word of God, if you will follow it and obey it, God is able to work. He is able to change us. So let's do that. That's all. That's, that's what I'm saying here. Now, what might happen as we finish this up? And really, let's, I think I'll finish it up. The potential result is repentance. Isn't that what we want? Look at verse 25. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil 
after being captured by him to do his will. Just a couple of things here. God may give them, it's not a guarantee. <laughs> it's not a guarantee. It doesn't say, do X, Y, Z, and God will give them repentance. No, that he might. We don't know. He might. But know this. Wherever there is true repentance, there is always a relationship to the truth. There will always be in true repentance, in, in the life of the repentor, they will care about the truth. That's what it says. That's what the text is saying there in 25. It will lead to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses. It means, <laughs> it means waking up out of a drunken stupor in Greek. They, they come out, they snap out of it, and realize, because it says there, escape from the snare of the devil, that word snare means to be captured alive. Captured alive. So they've been captured alive. If, I don't know if there's any trappers in here. I used to do some trapping. When you capture some animals alive, <laughs> you better be ready for a fight when you're trying to get them out of the trap. Worst thing to catch in a trap is a cat. You get a cat caught in a trap, like at a foothold. I know trappers that would carry like a, a trash can lid and a long pole with that noose thing on the end to get ready because it's going to be on as soon as you open up that box trap or whatever. One time I caught a bobcat in a trap. Things hanging upside down, like yowling at me. I'm like, boys, Charlie remembers this. I'm like, go over there and get that piece of plywood and have it ready. Because when I open this thing, I'm kicking it, and this thing could come out like all teeth and claws at me in a second. Praise the Lord, it took off. But my point being that when you're caught alive in a trap, how do you act? You're crazy. Why is it that the pro-life world acts so crazy when we're talking about the truth? They've been caught alive in a trap. Set by Satan. And you've you got to be gentle with them, that crazy thing, that tooth and claws thing that's coming at you, and understand that that thing was captured to do the will of Satan. They might not like to hear that, but there it is. The fact of the matter is, the only way to free them is with the truth. <laughs> and wow, is this hard. This is going to take work. This isn't just leaving a drop card. This isn't, you know, not to disparage that because God's used that mightily, right? But I'm saying that it's going to take conversation. It's going to take time. It's going to take some sacrifice in order to help them see that they're in a trap. That's worse because here they don't even know they're in a trap. They think we're the ones that are trapped. <clears throat> so that's what I That's what I got. <laughs> Not much more than that. And I just urge you on one hand, I am encouraged by the Norman statement, let's pursue that. I'd say that. I'll say this if there has ever been any doubt. I'm not pro-life, I'm an abolitionist. All right? I would encourage all of my friends at OSA, Love Life, um, uh, and Abortion Now, any other organization I'm forgetting, I encourage all of you to just be an abolitionist. And, <laughs> that's the way you started, you know? Let's finish that way. We're all getting older, every one of us. We're all getting older. Let's finish strong. Let's finish holding on to these principles that we said we've believed all along. Let's not be pulled aside, pulled away from these things because, it, because it's tempting. And believe me, you guys can pray for me because with this whole lore thing that we're working on, the thing that scares me the most about it is that it will succeed. I'm pretty sure it's going to work. And that scares me. Because that means there's going to be money involved and temptations involved and talk about temptation to compromise and things like that. That can happen to me. I've been listening to these sermons tonight. Haven't they been incredible? Yeah. 
And so I'm sitting here listening to this and going, man, I got to receive this. This isn't for somebody else. This is for me, right? And so help me, God, not to do that. And so if, we, if it ever goes crazy over there and they do something stupid or whatever, pray for me that I'll just have the guts to try to fight it and then eventually, if I can't fight it, to leave. But we all have to pray for each other like that because we all have those temptations just in different ways. All right, so we're in this together. I hope you get that. If you get nothing else from this conference, we're in this together. We are a family. Let's stand together for the sake of the gospel until the end. Amen. All right, let's go. Dear Lord, there's no, none of us are sufficient for these things. We have all failed in thought, word, and deed. We failed in these ways many times. Lord, forgive us. Help us, Lord. Give us this gift of repentance. Lord, free us from the own traps we've set for ourselves. And Lord, in those that Satan may have set for us, and help us to be free to go forward in the power of the word of God and trust you to bring the results. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Durban in particular and Darren Stid, Jeff's the lead of End Abortion Now. Je uh, Darren Stid is associate, I think, for OSA. Should have talked to them. Um, probably should have talked to Jason Storms as well. Before I spoke, as I spoke last night about specific things, one of the things I want to clarify is that I was jumping around between organizations while I was speaking. It wasn't intentional, but I want to be very clear that end abortion now cares about theology. And anybody that pays any attention to it knows that that's true. And so I didn't mean to communicate that. And I think I did accidentally communicate that in the way that I was jumping around. And you guys know that. Um, on, and specifically with end abortion now, I think we need to make sure that we recognize that whereas there might be parts of what they do that are, that are maybe unclear in my own mind, um, it, when it comes to what Jeff has said publicly about the pro-life world, they hate him for what he said. And they're, they're hating him for what he said because he's been very direct on this stuff. So let's be... Um, gracious and loving to our brother, right? And, and be thankful. I mean, we were talking today, Jared and I were talking, there really wouldn't be a conference if it wasn't for an abortion now. We, I mean, that's how Jerry got involved in their church. And so I want to be very careful to say, to give credit where credit is due and to honor to whom honor is due. And Jeff deserves that from his friends and, um, Jeff's been very gracious in, in talking about all these things. OSA, um, Darren was explaining to me that they've recently actually kicked out some people because of bad theology. So they said they agreed to a particular doctrinal statement, found out later that they hadn't. And so they're, they're trying to do better with that, and they are doing better with that. So let's give credit to that as well. Obviously, everything that I said last night regarding my concerns about groups that, that are uh, not kicking out the pro-life label, I still have those concerns. And um, we're working on trying to get a meeting uh, that would involve uh, several different people from these groups to try to get Russell and others from Free the States all together to actually try to hash some of these things out. So that would happen after this legislative session. Please pray that that will happen. If that is what comes out of all my goofy, you know, just being tired and saying all these things, then I, I think I'll praise God for that, if there would be that kind of meaning. So let's, I know we got some really strange stuff going on tonight. Um, but I want to just say that we do care about the law of God as, as it relates to the unborn, we've heard much great preaching on this. But one of the things that we must do is remember the commands of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, this commandment we have from him, 
Whoever loves his God must also love his brother. And so we would not, never bring an accusation against the brother without two or three witnesses. Isn't that a principle of the law of God? And so you can't do it without evidence. So let's be very careful about anything we say about anyone within, the, within this whole thing. That we're careful to make sure that those, there are those witnesses. And go to that person and talk to them about it before you throw it all up on the internet somewhere in a video or whatever, on blogs or anything. We, when we do it, we're violating that command. And what does the scripture say? Yes, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. But in Proverbs it also says he hates those that cause division amongst the brethren. And so let's be mindful of that and repentant of that as we go forward. Judgment is upon us, whether we have it or not, right? Judgment is upon us. So our question has to be, how are we going to navigate? And yes, we have to care about the unborn, but we also have to care about our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we care about the unborn, but we'll trample our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we're hypocrites. So let's watch that carefully. Let's guard ourselves carefully. Um, and Jeff uh, wanted me to convey this specifically. He's been following what's happening here, and he's really encouraged. He is really encouraged by what God's doing here in Kansas, and he wanted me to convey that to you all. The other thing that he said to me, I don't know that he knew I was going to say this, but he's also told me he's committed to not listening to any slander of Russell or free the states. And if he hears it, he's going to rebuke it. He says, if they do it, I'll say, she says, I'll say, where's your witnesses? Where's your evidence of that? Here's what I suggest. We do the same thing for him. Okay. Um, so that's all I've got. And so, brother, let's close this in prayer.